Oye, Rupa. Hi, Roger. Hi, Roger. How are you? I'm sorry. Is that echo? Give me one. Yeah, ¿Por qué cambié de nombre? Porque lo cambié y se vuelve a cambiar. Hi, Dr. Harris, good morning. Sorry, it would be hard to give the whole talk on me, so I'm okay. You were looking uh, very fresh for 4.45 in the morning. <laughs> Oh, and I'm, I, it's very funny because I thought it was 5 a.m. because I didn't know people started on the quarter hour. And I was sitting in my office and I thought, but there was something about 445. <laughs> so it's a good thing I looked again. Well, welcome, I think. Thank you. I think people are waiting here. Hi, to Jack. Good morning. Hi, it's Hi. Susan. How are you? Hi. Hi. How are you? It's so good to I'm see okay. you. Hi, Roger. Hi, everyone. Hey, Odette. How are you? Good seeing you. I I'm good. I'm good. Um, so I think we can get started here. Thank you for joining us. So good morning, everyone. Uh, today, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce Dr. Adet Arias, Professor of Neurosurgery at Stanford and Vice Chair of Diversity in the Department of Neurosurgery. Dr. Harris began her studies at Dartmouth, where she majored in biology, and then went on to Stanford to complete her MD. She trained in neurosurgery at Stanford, after which she received an MPH uh, specializing in epidemiology. She then completed not one, but two fellowships, including a, the prestigious Van Wagman Fellowship, followed by training in peripheral nerve at Louisiana State University. Her work has focused on trauma and peripheral nerve and traumatic brain injury. She serves as the director of brain injury and uh, does extensive work at the VA there as well. She has published extensive work in this area, but in addition to her research accolades, uh, she has really been dedicated to academics and furthering diversity and really encouraging the next generation to think differently and do differently. Uh, she's received numerous humanitarian awards. And in 2018, she was named a full professor of neurosurgery at Stanford, making history and becoming the first black tenured professor in the country. Uh, Dr. Adette Harris has really transformed uh, 
neurosurgery and neurosurgical training. And, you know, we've been very excited to hear about her work and her thoughts and how we can all strive to be better and uh, improve the field of neurosurgery. So Dr. Harris, welcome. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, and I know it's early there too. So thank you for waking up with me, so to speak. Um, so as was, thank you for such a kind introduction and thank you for uh, hosting me this morning. I'm, it's a pleasure. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces, so hello to everyone. Um, as was said, injury and traumatic brain injury has really been the mainstay of my academic career. Um, going all the way back to residency, I spent time, uh, thanks to the AANS, with a couple embedded fellowships. Um, and then after residency, I did in fact uh, go to uh, the developing world um, and to study traumatic brain injury in the West Indies uh, under my Van Wagenen. Um, and then my first faculty job was at Grady in Emory. Um, and as everyone knows, that is a very uh, high volume trauma place. So um, it, that was really baptism by fire, so to speak, and an incredible opportunity, um, just great, loved it. Uh, and then was recruited back to Stanford. Um, for this unique opportunity to work across the realms of uh, both uh, the Stanford setting and academic setting, but also with the DOD and with the VA. And that's just been an unparalleled opportunity. So I'm trauma, trauma, trauma all the time. And, and um, so I thought I would talk to you today about specifically about trauma. So I'm going to share um, my screen. Um, give me a second there. Okay, apologies there. All right, so I've so chosen to speak to you today again about- No, we're going on. Oh, I'm so sorry. Can you not see? Yeah, no, it looks good. Okay, great, sorry about that. Um, so I, I chose to talk to you today about tra polytrauma and traumatic brain injury. Um, and I, talked to, I chose to talk to you today about how do we stay current um, and look to the future. And what exactly does that mean in the context of, uh, of traumatic brain injury in particular? Um, I have no disclosures uh, to make. Um, so a few um, months ago, I was asked by the SNS to talk about the future of uh, traumatic brain injury and polytrauma management, neurotrauma specifically. And then also what does that mean um, in the context of also neural rehabilitation? And what does that mean for the next generation? And that was a pretty lofty topic. And I thought, oh gosh, you know, what, what exactly does that mean? And so I spent some time thinking about this for, uh, for this presentation and also just for my career in general. And I thought I would uh, share that uh, conversation with you in this presentation and hopefully we can all engage and I'll try to be brief. I, I think we have 45 minutes together. So when we think about the future and when we think about change for how do we, when we think about the future, when we think about what's up for the next generation, the concept of change obviously comes to mind. And for anyone over 30, change actually has this somewhat palpitation, negative association. I am an NPR junkie, right? Absolute junkie. And uh, before the pandemic, NPR did this series where they went around the country asking people, what do you think about your town and your city or your, your wherever you live? And what does change mean for you? And almost invariably, all the responses were negative, right? It didn't tell them probably, they only interviewed uh, adults and almost everyone had a negative association with change. People talked about how, you know, they hated the traffic, it was more congestion, all of these things. But invariably, it was a negative response. And I'm sure that this doesn't come as a surprise to us because for many of us, when we think about the future, we do have some trepidations about change. I'm sure everyone has seen this where you know, you're walking uphill both ways in the snow. Whenever you talk to the previous generation or for some of us, our generation about change, we sort of reminisce on this concept of the idealized past when I was your age, right? And you know, this is something that is quite interestingly has survived every culture, every you know, age. Uh, I'm from Jamaica and I heard this. I walked uphill in the snow both ways from older people in my community, which is hysterical because we don't actually have snow. So I'm not really sure where this was coming from. But nonetheless, this is how people associate change, but not kids, right? Kids have a very different association of change. For them, change is exciting, it's innovative, it's new. It's how they become who they, they are meant to be, right? And so for kids, change is essential. 
And so when I start, when I think about the future of our field, particularly neurotrauma, I try to be more childlike in my understanding and appreciation of change. When I show this to my kids who are teenagers, they say, why would anybody do that? Why would anybody walk uphill in the snow or walk uphill or walk anywhere when you could just take an Uber? And I think that sort of underscores this notion of change for the next generation. <clears throat> Excuse me. When we look to change, if you ask nine out of, uh, if you ask a room full of neurosurgeons, particularly at Stanford, 90% of them are gonna say, well, precision, Precision is the future. Precision is how we're gonna change the field. But when I think about neurotrauma again, what exactly does that mean? What does precision mean in the context of trauma and neuro rehabilitation? To me, the answer lies not in focusing on finding an elusive silver bullet or magic bullet, but rather on the methodologies that we employ in the care of these patients. The methodologies we use in the clinical arena, or in the research arena to augment care. To me, that is perhaps the, the best way to focus on precision in the context of trauma. But before we look to the future, I always think it's important for us to take some time and look to the past. And as an epidemiologist and someone coming to you from Stanford, I thought perhaps I would focus on two key, um, two key studies that answers a question that comes to mind when you think about the future, which is, what do we accept in Madison? What do we accept without question? What is entrenched in our thinking? And so this concept of entrenched thinking and how do we approach that when we think about change? So this study, the Stroke Stopwatch, which came out of Stanford, I'll spend some time just touching on that. And then of course the epidemiologist in me, the Framingham study, just spending some time talking about that and how do we use these two and learn from this and leverage when we think about change in the context of neurotrauma and polytrauma. So the Stroke Stopwatch, anybody who went to medical school before 2015 or so, you know, learned the AHA guidelines uh, for the early management of patients with acute ischemic acute ischemic stroke, that we had six hour window, this golden window to address, to address these patients and their issues, right? And this became dogma. This became entrenched in our thinking. Similarly, the Framingham study, right? The most influential study in our history, right? Uh, this basically became the model for the cohort design. And an origin of the term risk factor came from this study. There've been over a thousand publications from the Framingham study. And so this is a groundbreaking landmark study, right? And this has also become entrenched in our thinking. But when we look at these studies from the lens of change, right? When we look at these studies and we try to think, okay, what does this mean as we look forward? What does this mean? And when people challenge this, people like Greg Albers, let's look and see what the nuances are. So Greg Albers looked at this and said, okay, we're, we're, we're entrenched in our thinking that we have this window and that this window is incredibly narrow. But in fact, we're, we're sort of minimizing access to a whole host of patients that perhaps we could be providing some benefit to. And so, in so his work in 2015 to 2019, he designed and conducted two clinical trials with our stroke teams at Stanford, which is part of the neurosurgery department. And it demonstrated that in fact, this window might not be so fixed that some patients could in fact benefit from interventions that were more than six hours and possibly as long as 24 hours following stroke. And he learned that the stroke progression was actually variable. And this led to a groundbreaking change in the AHA recommendations. And they expanded this window from six to 24 hours following a stroke. So groundbreaking, increasing access to people who would otherwise not have had it based on that narrowed window by just challenging this notion that the six hour window was, was dogma. And now when we look at Framingham, right? Again, the most influential investigation in our model cohort design history, it started in 1948 and over 5,000 adults have been enrolled. And we're now in third generation of participants. And the concept of risk factor came from the study with over 1,000 publications. So talk about something that is entrenched, over 1,000 publications. But what we learned when we looked closely at Framingham was in fact that these, these cohorts, this cohort was in fact highly unrepresentative. In particular, it consisted almost entirely of white middle-class Americans, right? And that the study lacked representation. There were no blacks, no Latinos, or no Asians, 
And so how do we translate that study into our current population in the United States? And most importantly, how do we translate these findings that are so entrenched into our future? And so it begs us to question in whatever we're doing, whatever field we are in, what else in medicine do we hold true without challenge? And it's this question that has guided my research and will be the focus of, of the remainder of this talk. What else do we hold true without challenge? When I began my career, and I'll jokingly say a few years ago, um, you know, it was at a time where there was significant change in traumatic brain injury. And it upended much of what I understood about brain injury. As a young attending, I was super eager to embark on this career where I would be in this realm of, you know, the acute side of uh, civilian management of TBI, the surgeries, et cetera. And then hopefully be engaged in the transition of patients and getting them back to life and back to duty, right? But this was all upended. And my mentor, I know many of you know Dr. Adler, uh, my mentor sat me down and said, listen, there are four stages of your career, right? The first, as he said, was when you are unconsciously incompetent, where you don't know what you don't know. The second is when you are consciously incompetent, where you're acutely aware of what you don't know. And from there, you would move to being consciously competent, where you then start to appreciate what you do know. And from there, you would go to being unconsciously competent, which I'm sure is where many of the full professors, associate professors, and many of you Cornell people operate in the realm of being unconsciously competent. You just know what you're doing and you do it well. But at that time, I don't know where I am right now in the spectrum of my career, when, which one of those four phases, but I do know that back then I was very, very much in the unconsciously incompetent phase. I didn't know what I didn't know. But what I did know was that traumatic brain injury was a huge problem, right? We had almost a 1.4 million people suffering mild traumatic brain injury. Another 40% of all deaths from acute injury was a component of traumatic brain injury. And the costs to us were, stag were, were staggering at over $4 billion annually with indirect costs being 10 times greater. I also knew that our concept of traumatic brain injury had been sort of dichotomized into primary and secondary brain injury by groundbreaking work by Marshall and his colleagues in an, uh, trying to create an understanding of the biochemical changes and the ultimate cascade that led to neuronal cell death. So we did know that, but polytrauma upended that. Polytrauma upended that. And what changed was that our previous paradigms of primary and brain, secondary brain injury was now expanded. We had to think about primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary injuries. We had to incorporate things like the related trauma that resulted from the significant blood loss that would then ultimately impact their traumatic brain injury as well. We had to think about this overpressurization wave that made the brain and the spinal cord were particularly susceptible to from that primary blast. And all of these things came into our understanding of, of brain injury secondary to blast. And the term polytrauma evolved and was co-opted to describe this unique complex pattern of injuries that we saw with blast and combat exposure, right? And these patients we learned required an extraordinary level of integration that we had not seen before. And brain injury remained in the primary injury that drove the care of these individuals. And so, in thinking about how do we move forward in this context, we sat down as a group and thought about what would the management strategies look like? And the three key areas were how do we change or reorganize organize our organizational, our medical surgical and our research structures in order to improve our management strategies in this new era. And so when we think about our organizational strategies and what that looked like and how we changed that, right? In the beginning, we had absolutely no expertise to this new evolving notion of polytrauma or traumatic brain injury secondary to blast, traumatic brain injury in this context. We literally had no, no expertise nationwide and no understanding. And our units were very siloed, right? Brain injury was this isolated phenomenon, right? And there was very little thought about it, but we had to evolve. Right? We now had to get patients quickly to care and quickly to get them from care, our surgeries, what have you, out into the community and back to life. And most importantly, at that time, back to duty. And that became focus. And so we had to integrate and develop this integration of comprehensive care, right? Where the patient was at the center and the head injury was driving this, but recognizing that there were just a whole host of other issues that were playing on our patients and adding to their morbidity, 
And so we developed this integrated network where not only were we looking at the brain injury, but we were pulling in all of these comprehensive components, uh, technology, et cetera, in order to care for the patient at the center. And in that time, we were able to evolve a system of care that ultimately looked like this, where we have this integrated network and the blue dots remain these inpatient units and Palo Alto and Stanford is one of them, right? But as you can see, it became this integrated nationwide network that also included our non-contiguous states of Alaska and Hawaii and our territories as well. The Philippines, Samoa, Guam, uh, all became part of this integrated network in order to address this new evolved understanding uh, of the TBI patient. And then we looked to our medical surgical care. What were we doing from a clinical realm, right? And that was incredibly important. We had to understand in order to be able to uh, adjust or make changes as needed. And when we did that, as most, what we found was that most of our clinical changes did not, most of the clinical strategies that we were using did not need to change. And some of the key ones that we looked at were our guidelines, our collaboration with the American College of Surgeons and an interdisciplinary array of, of trauma doctors, and obviously across the medical spectrum with the Institute of Medicine. And what we what our research showed in our, in our delving, or deep diving rather into these uh, different uh, clinical strategies and guidelines was that in fact, we did not need to change much. And as you can see from work that came out of this era, which we were heavily involved in, right? What we did was we updated these, reinforced these, and this era actually strengthened our approach to the clinical management of the traumatic brain injured patient, right? It actually allowed us for very close collaboration. And in the end, what we found was that this was an improvement in the care of the patients that we were taking care of. And in that era and to date, we also looked at our research strategies and for those who follow this, there were several key research strategies initiated during that time. And although the magic bullet or the silver bullet or whatever you want to call it remains elusive, right? Um, we forged ahead with a number of groundbreaking studies that has allowed change in our approach to research in general, right? And that became really key. And I'm going to just dive into one of them, the progesterone study, because that's the most widely uh, known. And I'll just sort of touch on that for a second. For those who, who uh, were not aware, the progesterone study looked at over 30 pharmacological agents initially that um, were evaluated in clinical trials, all trying to improve traumatic brain injury and were unsuccessful. There were 65 animal studies conducted by 20 research groups with four different species. And they all reported that progesterone had a neuroprotective effect. And so this was the first human clinical trial examining the neuroprotective role of progesterone. We found that it was safe and it was without adverse effect, right? And if administered shortly after injury, it had benefit, right? It, it prevented neuronal loss, it improved functional outcome and so on and so forth. And so the first uh, human trial was published um, and these were colleagues all over the country. It was anchored at Emory at the time. And this, this trial was groundbreaking and led to um, us diving even deeper into this concept because the conclusions were that there was no discernible harm, that there was some benefit to patients with traumatic brain injury. And so this led to designing and in initiating a phase three trial with multiple clinical sites, right? And so as you can see, what was interesting about this was that it was not only in the civilian sector, but the reach of this study and that it also included DOD sites and it also included VA sites. And the study enrolled over a thousand patients, right? And, excuse me, over a six month outcome, uh, multiple things were looked at in order to track these patients. But ultimately the study was close to enrollment due to futility. But what the study did achieve was that it was, uh, and what was significant rather in the study was that it was simple, right? It was a very simple design, that it was consistent, right? And that the reach, could include not only civilian sites, but military and VA sites. And it changed our research approach, right? We learned how to standardize, how to work together as a team and as a field. We were able to agree on key indices that we would follow and data standardization, right? And this became really quite important and the crux of much of the success that would come in clinical research to follow. So this actually led to significant changes in our research structure. Sorry. And during that, sorry, apologies. And during that time, right, traumatic brain injury from blast continued, 
right? And as anybody in the field would recognize, you start studying it. You start studying, what does this mean? What does this mean? This became the signature wound of the conflicts that we were engaged in. So everyone wanted to take a look at what this meant. And so all of these studies kept coming out, right? And you would see this onslaught of literature, onslaught of literature. And the question became, right? What exactly are we looking at and how are we shaping this cohort? And what did the data tell us, right? And how do we take this and translate it into the patients that we're taking care of, right? And what we learned was that traumatic brain injury second to blast, the majority, like most brain injury, was mild. 95% of those were diagnosed were male. And most of the published research was giving us a descriptive characteristic of the patients, right? But if you look in most of the studies, the predominance was male, 80 to 100%. There were several studies that had all male in the cohort and no female at all. And it made me think that this information was important because it allowed me to think about what happens when you're engaged in studies like Framingham, right? It's what, you, what we use to get more funding for more studies. So studies beget studies, right? It also shapes how we think about the disease entity, right? And it also shapes our clinical management of these patients and ultimately the future of how we treat these patients. But I was concerned. I was concerned that what we were learning here might not in fact be translatable or generalizable rather, right? Were we in fact doing exactly what we had done in Framingham? Were we in fact creating a cohort that might be unrepresentative and therefore limited in its ability to be generalized as we were shaping our understanding of this emerging cohort of polytrauma patients? So we looked again, right? We were learning about the prevalence. We were learning about the symptoms that came from these, and we were getting a broad description of the needs of this cohort. But the question was, are these conclusions applicable to everyone in the cohort? What was happening to the subpopulations? And so we went back and we decided to look closely at this. And with funding from multiple institutions, including Stanford, including the VA, including the DOD, right? Um, we decided to ask this question were these representative of the entire cohort? We recognized that their women were noise in the data set, and we were concerned specifically about potential gender bias. So we decided to go out and to compare apples to apples. We looked at the data collected in the field, and we ourselves collected that data, and we focused on outcome domains that were represented in the field, and they were presented here. So diagnoses, post-concussive symptoms, and neurobehavioral symptoms. And we compared our cohort with the cohort that was represented in the literature. And what we found was in fact, that women were more likely to be unemployed, less likely to be working, more likely to be homeless. And this was despite being better educated than their male cohorts uh, who have suffered traumatic brain injury and similarly, um, uh, similar uh, uh, exposures. And when we looked at psychiatric diagnosis and substance abuse, similarly for women, as you can see in red, we found that the data was astounding. Women had more depression symptoms, more PTSD, more anxiety, more substance abuse, and so on and so on. And when we looked at post-concussive symptoms, we saw similar trends, more chronic pain, right? More sleep disturbances, more uh, 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 neurological problem rating. And this was of course concerning. And when we looked at our neurobehavioral symptoms, again, somatosensory and vestibular complaints were more represented in our female cohort. And as we summarized this, what we found was that women had difficulties with community reintegration following their traumatic brain injury, despite similar rehabilitation programs, et cetera, more likely to be homeless, more likely to be diagnosed with a whole host of symptoms detailed here on this uh, slide and more likely to suffer chronic pain, chronic headaches, somatosensory disorders, and vestibular symptoms uh, when compared to their male cohort. And this was of course concerning because the data kept coming. Despite these differences that we could identify, the data kept coming and painting a picture that did not represent what we were finding. The data was excluding these because the women were in fact noise in the data set. And we realized very quickly that we needed more data. And so we dove in and we decided to do a more focused investigation where we looked at a cross-sectional and matched analysis between men and women trying to better understand what was happening here. And so we decided to look 
um, and matching um, male and female cohorts on several uh, key methodological components, such as age, time of admission, mechanism of injury. And again, we looked at the same outcome domains that were evaluated previously. And again, we found significant differences in vestibular and cognitive realms when it, compared, when it, when it came to women versus the men, men in the cohort. And we found that women reported significantly increased vestibular symptoms and significantly increased cognitive symptoms when it came to the male cohort. And when we looked at reintegration, this was also significant. The female cohort was the only significant predictor variable with the increased likelihood of living alone, right? And employment status uh, was also evaluated as well. And overall, the results were consistent with our previous findings when we were not doing this matched analysis. And so it actually supported those findings that there were differences in neurobehavioral symptom reporting for women and differences in reintegration indices for women. And so we decided next step would be to look at the brain behavioral relationship with respect to TBI. And we wanted to look at executive function with brain injury. We wanted specifically to understand the, the relationship between brain and the neuropsych measures that we were looking at. And we decided to use cortical thickness as a surrogate for that. Um, and we decided to do that with our colleagues in neuroscience and one of my uh, key senior scientists in my lab, Dr. Adamson, um, who, who specializes in uh, neuroradiology and neuroscience. And we looked at structural differences with cortical thickness in women. And what we found was while there was significant cortical thinning for women with traumatic brain injury, right? Um, on average, um, uh, th there was no significant difference for men uh, in the cohort. And we found that women had 6% um, uh, greater cortical thickness than men after cortical thickness was, nor was normalized. This was not new. This was actually also consistent with the literature. And the more cortical thinning was found in women with TBI than men with TBI, right? And this was also consistent and concerning. And so as we looked at this, our NSI showed differences in cognitive and vestibular symptoms. Our reintegration indices were different. And the brain anatomy told us that women had greater cortical thinning than men years after injury. And so if we take a step back and look at the path of investigation that we took, the hypothesis was that women were these small numbers in the general population, right? And that their experience was not wholly represented by the published literature. And this was a problem because we use the literature for data-driven decisions, right? And for further research. And so our first level was really establishing these differences and trying to identify if women were in fact captured wholly in the literature. And the gaps that we identified were significant. We then went to a second level evaluation where we focused on symptoms and cohort in the cross-sectional and matched analysis. And again, we found differences there. And then we went to a third level evaluation where we were looking specifically, exploring the anatomical differences that existed and if in fact they correlated with the executive function and neuropsychological evaluation that we were doing. And again, we found that that was the case. So that sort of led us down this path that we are right on, on right now and trying to understand um, more precisely how our methodologies are different and what needs to happen in order to better understand this cohort. And what we have found was that there's a lot of need, right? We need better analytical tools, appropriate and specific to women. So going back to how do we change and how do we change what's entrenched in our understanding and our approach uh, in medicine, right? So the first thing is a change in the methodologies, right? The, the current methodologies are not specific to cohorts where specific subcohort might in fact be noise, and in this case, women. And so we had to employ better methodologic tools. And, and our data supported that this is in fact important and necessary to understand. So that's number one. Number two is really trying to have a better and a more precise understanding of these cohorts at all. So not only the methodologies, but the interest in trying to understand these individuals. We found that there was a strong correlation with the published data, but the outcomes that were in the published data were generated and driven by the male cohort. So those two need to be adjusted in order to better understand what's happening to the female in the cohort. 
And we also found that we need advanced analytical methods to be able to look at the heterogeneity of this population rather than just 100% of the cohort being male and going with that data set. And so this is where we, where we landed. And our conclusions have significant implications uh, for innovative treatment studies, right? And changes how we would assess uh, self-report and symptoms. And we believe that we need a more comprehensive model that we are working on to incorporate all of these um, different findings to better understand the female uh, in, the, in, in the military and their, their experience in polytrauma injuries. As a reminder, like this is not an abstract thing. We're dealing with real lives and real people and you know, real individuals whose lives are affected by these injuries and their outcomes are not that of their male counterpart, right? And so this is important to understand them in order to make a difference. Female veterans are in fact experiencing homelessness at a much higher rate with traumatic brain injury despite our best efforts when compared to their male cohort as, as one small example. And what's interesting is that the data keeps coming and the data is not wholly capturing their experience even as we grow to understand that nuanced methodologies are key in all that we do. We keep saying, seeing data that does not take that into account and that is concerning. And so what we've been trying to do is to combat that data with our own work, right? To better understand this cohort. And so these are some of the papers that our recent work to show that these differences are out there. And so we publish and try to publish and speak extensively on this to, for people to really understand the difference. And our most recent paper came out this week, actually, um, which looked at uh, the, the cortical thickness differences that we talked about and adding diffusion properties in patients with traumatic brain injury. And these findings contribute to a growing discussion on sex differences in cortical thickness and diffusion properties. This is really quite um, important for us as a field to understand the nuance of, of, of what happens when we look at subpopulations in our field. And our, our work was just recently um, uh, contributed to um, NASM, working with uh, many of our colleagues uh, in traumatic brain injury with the National Academy of Sciences. And we just put out the, the roadmap for accelerating progress. And I hope everyone interested in TBI takes a look at this work. It was literally released two weeks ago, um, but I hope you all uh, look at this because it does really give a roadmap for better management of traumatic brain injury, taking these nuances into account. And when I present this, um, people oftentimes say, well, I don't understand. And many of my colleagues in the field say, I don't understand. These patients are receiving the same treatment, right? And so why are we seeing these differences? And I would say that that is in fact the problem, right? That is in fact the problem. Epidemiology is a powerful tool in understanding how precision care can be better delivered. We don't need to apply the same treatment to all of the patients themselves. In fact, we need to be more focused. We need to be more precise. Um, in, as we do this. And so for us, the, the future is in precision, it's in understanding bias, and it's in, it's in disrupting what is entrenched. So asking always, what do we take as dogma, right? And how has time challenged these principles in medicine? And if it hasn't, should it? And should we? What can we learn, right, um, from this study and from TBI and polytrauma in general? What is the value of subpopulation focused research? Right? And then the lessons that we learn in gender, can we, can, is this applicable to approaches and in innovation and how can we use this in other realms of traumatic brain injury? And I wanna thank you for your attention to this subject and allowing me to speak today. I'm mindful of the time and I think I have maybe five minutes, I'm not sure, so I'll stop there um, and answer any questions that we might have. And thanks to those who have supported this work um, as well. Thank you so much. I will stop sharing and open to any questions. Thank you so much for, for such a great talk. And I think for really just challenging how we think about things, you know, I, I think obviously the key to being able to uh, find a difference is asking the question if it exists. So I was curious sort of how this, how this came about and how you thought about it. Um, and uh, additionally, you know, I was really interested in what you were talking about moving towards just this more subpopulation type analysis. Um, it, you know, it sounds like the there's clearly so many differences that we have yet to uncover that can impact care and it almost feels as though we would be moving towards a precision medicine type model similar to how what we've done in oncology where we're really looking at each individual patient and that's so well established in that area you know it's curious what you think about 
um, you know, that being more tailored in the trauma area where I think, you know, as you pointed out, we, we use this one size fits all model um, and so, sort of how far we would go in that direction. And then with respect to subpopulations, you know, where, where do we stop? So, you know, we're all individuals. Um, and so we can keep looking at populations and subpopulations within, even with the, you know, within, you know, we look at gender and then we look at race and we look at socioeconomic factors. So I was just curious, uh, you know, how, how you think about those things. I think the second part of your question is probably the most intriguing, right? Like, where do we stop in terms of this? Because that that gets at the question that people ask and um, is, well, we're giving them the same. So we think we're being equitable, right? So how do we be more equitable? Is that even a thing, right? Um, I will say that the, the, the first step is actually a recognition that there's a difference. That's the first step. Like, and I think once we all agree to that, then I think it, the, the sky's the limit in terms of what we can understand and how we can approach. You know, when we were working on the NASM paper, um, I think one of the key things people kept saying is that we have not evolved from the GCS, mild, moderate, and severe. That's where we are. Like, I mean, in cancer, as you pointed out, that would be laughable, right? Um, in terms of subtypes and all the rest of it, that doesn't exist in traumatic brain injury. And I think because for so long, we've just not had even an understanding and a recognition that there could be differences and nuances in those fields. And so I think that becomes step number one. Um, I will say though that uh, where, where we would stop, although I don't have a definitive answer for that, I will say the impact would be a great guide to understanding what's equitable, right? So when outcomes become parallel or sorry, equitable, become similar to other different cohorts, then I think that's a good place to kind of rest and think, okay, we're, we're, we're there. Um, I also wanted to point out at the risk of sounding aggrandizing, self-aggrandizing, is that the real life implications of some of this work, right? So, um, you know, we've been really sort of deliberate in how we have rolled this out because you could imagine that there's somewhat of a backlash. Like when we first presented this, people were like, oh, this is a great reason why women should not be deployed, right? Or in combat. And you're sort of like, no, 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 that's not what I'm saying. Like, I'm not saying that, you know, because men are having these problems too, yet we wouldn't imagine a military where we don't deploy men, right? So that doesn't make any sense. But yet we went right there for women, right? We went and we do that for all subpopulations when we think about this. Well, well, this subpopulation has this, okay, let's not do that. But we don't think about what it means in the greater context. Um, I first uh, presented this obviously like at you know academic meetings, et cetera. And then I was ultimately invited to present this um, at the Pentagon uh, to the then Department of uh, Secretary of Defense. Uh, because as you can imagine, this could have some uh, implications rather for force readiness and all the rest of it. And from there, I was invited to present this to the Secretary of Labor. Uh, and um, the reason being is that uh, many of our strategies are so like one size fits all when it comes to taking care of people post injury and, and in the military. And one of the key things that we do when people have high um, homelessness rates or um, uh, um, high unemployment rates is we think about education as a remedy, right? And so the Department of Labor, of course, that's part of what they do. And what we learned was that women are actually better educated than their male cohorts, right? So as an example, how would that strategy work, right? You're making them more educated, like, but that's not the problem. So that's just a real life example of how this data translates into the real world and gets people to stop and think, actually, we're missing something here. What are we missing, right? And, um, you know, and although I don't have the answer, I can tell you that a key piece of the reintegration, like we look and they have significant neurosensory problems. And if you've ever taken care of a patient with neurosensory issues, right, vestibular issues, uh, it's really difficult for them to reintegrate with those complaints. So that's just like, just the fact that we looked and recognized that there could be a difference has changed how um, we approach the patients in, in understanding their reintegration issues and actually changed policy as it came to, you know, what we give to individuals in terms of a blanket versus a tailored or precise uh, management strategies to get them back into the world. Um, I spoke through someone, uh, uh, Dr. Tabor, did you have a question? I saw your hand up. Hey, Odette, yes, thank you. Thanks first for the talk and for the, for the work behind it. My question is, and I apologize if you approached it, I was a bit late for your talk. Was there, um, do you think the difference is, uh, lies largely in how a female, um, female biology responds to trauma, which we know hormones are an important part of, or in how they rehabilitate um, in order to start even thinking, you know, if the pathophysiology is a little bit different uh, from the get-go, it, it can explain a lot of things. And if the, if the treatment 
um, it, which or response to treatment a little bit different is also um, uh, relevant to think about. And in that regard, I was wondering, although probably age here is limited to the young, whether there is a stratification in response to trauma between older and younger uh, subjects, particularly the women. So excellent questions. And the first question um, in terms of the pathophysiology is, um, yes, we thought about that, right? Because we like, it's one of the reasons why I shared the progesterone study, right? Because that was, um, uh, you know, one of the thinking behind uh, progesterone being neuroprotective, right? Um, but the, the path that we've chosen for this particular area of study is to well, first, what we did was we wanted to just look and see what, what the literature was saying, which was nothing, right? Um, and then take out, uh, look at our, our cohort and see how they were comparing to the literature, right? And then once we did that, we thought, okay, is there some cohort effect, et cetera? So then we did the matched analysis, right? And then we did like, so we're trying to be staged about it. We're at the stage in the research right now where we're looking at anatomical differences that might lead to it, not, not physiological differences, but anatomical differences. Um, and then ultimately we're folding in biomarkers and things like that, that would ultimately lead to the question and answering of pathophysiology. So we've taken this very, we've laid out this very specific approach to looking at executive function, neuropsych, again, what's in the literature to guide us, right? Because this is a fairly new field for us. And then added to it our own uh, understanding of um, anatomical differences and how those correlate to what's in the field. And the next would be the pathophysiology. So we're going there. And um, to your question of age, I think that too is interesting. For polytrauma um, or trauma secondary to blast, um, the average age is actually quite young. Um, it's much, much younger than any other um, uh, uh, cohort in the military we've seen before. So we're dealing with a fairly young cohort. And so we would expect sort of the best outcomes from these patients um, when we're looking at age. But we have not stratified because we've not done a prospective in any way. And, um, and, and that too might be the next step we might go to. Um, but, uh, but we've not stratified by age. And I really quite like that question as well to think and, about And that. is there um, literature on, let's say more on the civilian trauma uh, area in terms of comparing uh, women and men? You know, I'm thinking traumatic subdurals, traumatic, yeah. you know, uh, blunt head injury in, in the elderly, which we all deal with. And sometimes are shocked at how poorly people do in the rather, in relation to what might look like a relatively small injury. So I'm, I'm just curious. Yeah, no, there have been some smaller studies uh, on uh, subdurals like that I'm aware of. But part of the issue is that much of our literature does not take us in, uh, neurosurgery literature doesn't take us into the reintegration and beyond. And so it was one of the benefits of actually doing a study in the context of the DOD and the VA where they have this lifelong commitment to these patients. So I can track them eight years out to be able to see true outcomes. Um, those, those papers are small and limited and not comprehensive. And we actually worked uh, with the NIH on a white paper looking at gender and traumatic brain injury to answer, to sort of meet that gap that was there to give some guidance because um, it, it just isn't there at all. But, um, but I think it should be. Um, and in fact, um, where some of our research is going, um, in, you know, is that we're also looking at these differences in spinal cord injury um, as well, because, you know, we see a lot of that in, in trauma, obviously. Um, and we're also finding similar differences in, in spinal cord injury. So your question about the pathophysiology, I think, is really quite, um, uh, quite important. Um, and what I didn't share was how we started on this research, not only from the Framingham study, but um, the, initially we were looking at our cohorts and we saw some differences in outcomes with male and female patients, right? Um, and when we looked more closely at the female patients, the data was entirely difficult to assess because there were so few female patients that one patient would skew the data. And we also found that many of them had dual diagnoses of brain and spinal cord injury. And in fact, that impacted their outcomes, right? And that led to, you know, I won't go into all the details, but that led to work with UCSF and Jeff Manley's group and our group looking at trying to create a mouse model that was both brain and spinal cord injury and trying to look at that. And there were some early studies on that. So, um, so it, did, it does touch on some of the pathophysiology. And I, and, I, and I think there might be a connection there. I just don't know the answer yet. I'd love to find out though. <laughs> Closing the loop on cancer with Rupa's question, 
there's no question that outcomes in cancer are also very population specific. You know, we just had a study from MSK, not in neurosurgery, but really important where African-American women um, have far higher rates of lymphedema and, you know, needless to say, outcomes in cancer are very different uh, based on socioeconomic and, and other uh, perhaps more physiologically relevant uh, reasons. So we need a lot more of this. I'm glad that there's a lot of residents on this talk because residents really move the research, the original retrospective research. So a stronger sense of the relevance of gender and subpopulation in epidemiological studies is really critically needed, I think. Yeah. And I don't think our residents are old enough to know that, you know, it was only less than a decade ago that we understood that we needed to, the NIH needed to mandate, like looking at gender and not just having an entire male cohort. I mean, I'm sure you and you appreciate, like when, when I was in med school and residency, you could see whole studies where they never even looked at women and they would just extrapolate to, you know, so, um, so, and, and I'm sure it was a resident who championed some of those efforts for sure. So more power to you guys. Keep us, keep us, keep pushing us to innovate. Well, thank you so much, and thank you for telling us, challenging us to ask these questions. And I think there are, you know, there's sort of an endless possibility in what else we can, what other dogmas we can challenge. Um, so, and thank you for joining us at 4:45 in the morning. Uh, hopefully, you get some sleep after this, and we hope oh, no, to I'm see you that. in person sometime when you don't have to wake up quite so early. Wow! Thank you so much for having me, you guys, and you're all welcome to Stanford anytime. So.